That was a cue for you to say good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. All right. Make sure we got some uh, energy in the room. I'm Lanny Cohen. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer for Capgemini. And I want to welcome you to our Innovation Hub here in New York City, uh, which is part of our Applied Innovation Exchange. Um, how many first timers here? Probably quite a few. Wow, about half the room. Well, that's great. For those of you returning, thanks for coming back. Obviously, we didn't do anything to offend anyone, so you're back. That's great. Uh, and for those of you who are here for the first time, um, what we do in a facility like this is we uh, do mostly customer interactions. Once a month, we assemble an audience like this together to hear some very leading edge thinking on some very significant topic around innovation in the market. But normally, day to day, we're interacting with customers here and we're helping them explore some of the new trends and the new dynamics in the market and how it might affect their business or their industry. And then as part of that, we think a lot about business outcomes and new business levels of performance, uh, and probably equally important, how they actually achieve those. Because what we find with innovation and why we've built out a facility like this is innovation is more of a challenge around applying innovation and adopting it and consuming it at scale uh, than it is just about the new idea itself. And we spend a lot of time with customers uh, working on that across every industry. This is one of 12 innovation exchanges we have around the world, uh, and many of which are, are all connected. In fact, we're live streaming this tonight to uh, our facility in Toronto and San Francisco. So they're kind of beaming in live and uh, we'll enjoy the evening. So um, the other thing I want to mention to you is last night I had an opportunity to be with a business executive uh, from China. Uh, talking about the subject of artificial intelligence. And I only bring it up because I think we're in such a fascinating time in the market. Uh, this individual runs some very significant businesses over in China. And in the discussion, when you get that kind of cultural perspective on a topic like AI, which is controversial to say the least, uh, but when, it, when somebody's coming at it from, uh, from kind, of a, a, kind of an Eastern uh, religious and spiritual perspective, and how they view things like artificial intelligence and the difference between knowledge and wisdom and how do you make sure people are getting educated in the right ways to actually leverage these types of technologies and new disruptions. It makes for a very fascinating conversation. And one of the things I think, again, we've done with this Applied Innovation Exchange globally is to bring together various, various perspectives on, on the topics that we explore. Because most of our customers are global and how something can affect their business in the US may be quite different than the considerations when they're dealing with uh, these topics in other parts of the world. So enough about my lecture. Uh, one thing I do want to do before we start the program is I want to introduce you to a couple of my colleagues. So when we end the session tonight, if you want to learn more about what we do at Capgemini and innovation and the Applied Innovation Exchange, you'll know who to reach out to. So uh, one of my colleagues back here, Sam Burden, uh, Bob Schwartz, who uh, oversees our New York and our rest of our Americas Applied Innovation Exchanges. Uh, Peter Maloof's here somewhere, I think. Peter, Peter, Peter. Peter's over here. Peter's our new, very new director here in our New York facility. Uh, did I miss any of my AIE colleagues? I know there are several in the back that'll join us later, but I guess that's it. Okay, so we have an incredible program tonight a super fun topic, uh, a lot of new discussions, new dialogues, new discoveries on this topic. Um, so without further ado, I wanna introduce you to our partner who we've been doing these what's nows in San Francisco and in New York for over two years now. Uh, and it's been a great relationship and I'll let Pete start the program off. Pete Leiden from reInvent. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Lanny. Thank you, Lanny, and thank you, uh, Capgemini. I mean, it's worth pointing out here that this is our, we're coming up on our first year. Uh, we did start this out in San Francisco, and we took a little flyer and said, well, let's maybe try this out in New York. And some of you, there's a few faces who might have been at the first one with Steven Johnson last November. We're coming up on a year here. And I want to say this is that every month now, in New York, we've brought some really remarkable innovator from a different field that's of importance to the New York region. Uh, we've been in media, we've been in finance, we've been in healthcare and medicine, we've been in the maker movement, we've been in, uh, in a lot of technology all around there. 
And every time uh, it's to expand our kind of view and cross fertilize and cross connect the network. So we've been really fortunate now coming up on a year here. And the other thing that's been happening is through these kind of gatherings, now we're gathering in people who are interested in transportation or real estate or uh, public policy. We're essentially cross-connecting a real diverse interdisciplinary network, and that's all you folks. And so I want to thank you folks for actually being part of this network, spreading the word, bringing in interesting guests, and actually really uh, building what is really what we're building here. And with that, it circles back to Capgemini. Without their commitment to this and without their resources to really make this happen, we wouldn't have this. So thank everyone in this room right now. Now this brings us to our remarkable person for tonight, and we have a real remarkable person here, a genuine remarkable one, uh, Robin Chase. Um, Robin uh, is many things, but one of the things she was, uh, was the co-founder and longtime CEO of Zipcar, which was founded in 2000. I mean, think about that. It was one of the pioneering companies in the shared mobility space, shared cars, and to this day, it's the, still the largest company uh, for shared cars in the world. Um, she was ahead of the game there, way ahead of the game in terms of what was really coming to the world. Then she kind of kept moving and was seeing the dispersion of all these smartphones in everybody's hands and that rise of platforms. And so she really saw the coming of Uber and Airbnb and all this other kind of collaborative economy that essentially she kind of crystallized in a fantastic book called Peers Inc., which came out of that period. Uh, of her life. And now, of course, Restless Robin is now on to the next big challenge. She's basically looking at the disruption of autonomous vehicles uh, and really starting to really fundamentally rethink uh, where do we go with that. And she is now essentially helping initiate uh, a big new initiative called the New Urban Mob Mobility Alliance. And that's going to be housed and is housed at the World Resource Institute. And that is essentially backed by Stephen Ross, who is with us tonight. Stephen is a well-known developer uh, of many prominent, like Hudson Yards and the Time Warner Center here. Uh, and he has essentially funded a thing called the Ross, Center for, uh, the Ross Center for Sustainable Cities. And we've got Stephen here and his wife. And we've also got Ani Gascubuta, uh, who's basically heading that whole center. And we'll get to hear from him a little bit later. Um, we're all here, those included just right there, to hear Robin's latest thinking about what is without question one of the big challenges facing not just New York City, but all major cities in the United States and really all over the world. In the world. And that is the insane traffic congestion and essentially transportation paralysis that's going on here. Now, now Robin, instead of just dwelling on the negatives, characteristically is an optimist. And so what she's really going to be talking about tonight is how do we solve this thing? How do we really start seeing how we can solve this? And she is actually sees that this is a totally solvable problem with the technology which we have and what's certainly newly coming. If we plan ahead enough, really think this through and get this right. And so she's going to basically uh, lay that out tonight. Now, the problem in a nutshell, which she will expand on further, is that we're caught between two paradigms, two transportation paradigms. One is a 20th century paradigm organized around individual personalized cars. And the 21st century paradigm is around all kinds of modes of shared mobility. And to get from here to there is the key. She's got a vision of how to do that. Now, so she's going to basically lay out in a presentation for the first time, I think. Maybe there was a little flicker at an earlier one. She's going to lay out for the first time uh, her thoughts on this. And this is what's not the best, getting someone's raw thoughts, newest things, rough ideas, get them out there to you folks to get the kind of feedback. Then we'll roll into a con our characteristic conversation with all of you. And I tell you, I've seen the list. There is an amazing group of folks in here and it's tied into all kinds of levels, transportation, public policy, uh, real estate, all kinds of stuff. We'll have a conversation with that. It's all going to go out over video. It's a live streamed here. If you guys want to hashtag it there if you want to send out, that's how you can get the live stream. It'll also be out there for anyone to see later on. And so with that, I think we have to get the ball rolling and get Robin up here to give her latest ideas. So let's give a welcome to Robin. Do you guys know I give so many talks in a year, and this audience is really dear to me. And so I think, ah, the people in this audience I really care about. They come from the other guys, like whatever. But this audience I really care about. 
Um, so I took a long time to prepare this talk, and it is the, the, my, my best thinking about going forward. And I look forward to all the things that you're going to tell me that you like or hate about it. Uh, so here goes. There you go. Okay. Um, the future of transport in two movements. Uh, infrastructure is destiny. Am I sitting in a wrong spot? No, that's fine. Infrastructure is destiny is the first part, and then we need to build on solid ground. I want to start with something that I'm hoping many of you in the transportation sector have seen before. that I hope many of you have seen before, and maybe I feel like I'm butting less of the audience on this side. Okay. So, how many people does the space require to move 60 people from A to B? And so here's personal cars. We know that's what it looks like. Famously, yes, we can get 60 people into a bus. Look at that empty street. It's not congested, so much room. And here is 60 people on their bicycles. Um, this is really quite famous in the transport sector, this set of slides. On Twitter, I found this set. So here we are, personal car. Here we are with Uber. Here we are with autonomous vehicles. <laughs> if we keep doing the same things, we're going to get the same things. <laughs> These fantastic technologies aren't going to do anything for us unless we make some changes. So infrastructure is destiny. When we built Levitt Town, in the late 40s. We necessarily had to build the interstate highway system. When we built those two things, necessarily and profoundly, we were going to get this and the obesity epidemic that we have in the US. The one plus the other, that infrastructure created this destiny. That was the place we were going when we built those things. On the other hand, in the Netherlands, they spent 40 years building a bicycle-friendly infrastructure. And so they have a totally different thing that's happened. Um, in the Netherlands, people are cycling an average of 864 kilometers of year, per year, and they're only 12% of them are obese over the age of 15. And in the US, we have 47 kilometers per year on average and a 36% obesity rate. So infrastructure is destiny. I've been thinking about this kind of in a much broader way, though. If I think about human nature, that is a certain kind of infrastructure that all of us come with. And if any of you read um, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, it's a fantastic book. And the thinking fast that is part of our human nature is we do the easy and cheap thing every time. We really favor ease and convenience. Like, that is what we do. It's built inside of us. If it's easy and cheap, that's what I do. I've been, so when we think about this infrastructure, infrastructure. How about equality of infrastructure? I think that's what the US and many countries are really striving for and we need to be much more thoughtful about. So when we build this infrastructure, is it fair? Is everyone getting where they need to go? And are they paying the right price in the appropriate time, in good conditions? Are we improving the travel conditions for all sorts of people? And so we have to think about this as we're planning and thinking about this destiny and our transportation infrastructure. So I think that's kind of an undergirding of what's going on. Here's an example. This is another famous photo in certain transportation circles. This is in Bogota, Colombia. Um, that mayor was building out infrastructure, and he decided not to build a super highway that was a second level going through the middle of the city, because he said 97% of my population doesn't own cars. So what he built was this instead. He invested money in places for bicycles and for pedestrians, put a lot of money into it because that was the people who lived there. That's how they could get around. And here, he would lovely point out, this is what the road infrastructure looks like because people didn't own cars there and that wasn't going to help them. And so they invested where there was for equity reasons. So over the last 100 years, we have specifically and proactively made personal cars easy and cheap. That's what we've been doing for the last 100 years. And I think about this as our tax and regulatory infrastructure. So we have underpriced 
air pollution, we don't charge for it. We have underpriced congestion, we don't charge for it. We have underpriced curb access. Parking is typically quite cheap. My daughter lives in Brooklyn and I think it's free. Um, in terms of scarcity, the pick up and drop off, and basic user fees to pay for our infrastructure, we don't charge enough for. So we have been underpricing our personal trans cars for so long, so this marking, this, we now have this misalignment between the market signals and, and how we use, and how we want people to use vehicles. So we overconsume car travel. We do this everywhere around the world. This is the status quo in every city, not just New York, everywhere. And this really is, to repeat what I'm saying, this is our tax and regulatory infrastructure. This is built in, this is our destiny because we don't price for these things. So I want to do one more of these, our planetary infrastructure, which is, I would say, the most important infrastructure that we have. Like, this is our real destiny. If we don't get this right, there isn't any other planet, as we know. So I want to just um, pull this up for you. This is a chart from NOAA. Globally, is this year hotter or colder than the 20th century average? If you've been born since 1980, you have never lived in a year that was cooler than the 20th century average. And here is 2015, um, 2016, 2017. 2018 is coming in around that 2016 year. We've already warmed the planet by about one degree centigrade on average. Scientists are telling us that if we continue with business as usual, we'll warm the planet by plus five or six degrees centigrade by 2100. And so the question for all of us is, what does that mean? What does it mean? What does it feel like to warm a planet by five or six degrees centigrade? I certainly couldn't put it into any context that I knew. So I went and did some research, and I found out that the last time it was minus four and a half degrees was 20,000 years ago. And I just want to throw this up. Here is my bed in Boston would be under a kilometer and a half of ice. And if you lived in Montreal, you'd be sleeping under three kilometers of ice. So picture 20,000 years ago, minus four and a half degrees, all across North America and, and Europe, we were sleeping under kilometers of ice. There were, of course, no humans. That's what it feels like to warm a planet by four and a half degrees. So if you're imagining that plus five or six degrees centigrade isn't existential, catastrophic, just see what this four and a half degrees did over 20,000 years. And so we're going forward that amount in 85. Like, it is a crazy thing. And so I want to say every single breath I take is really addressing this issue. There, and we, here we are in New York Climate Week. We really don't have any time to spare. So technology, oh my gosh, here it is right now, this amazing deus ex machina that's coming in. We have GPS and the internet and wireless and smartphones and e-payment, open data, electric batteries, this incredible amount of stuff that is exploding right at this very minute. And I do think of it as creating this explosion of innovations of which Zipcar was a front-running part. And so this is completely changing what is possible in cities. It's a whole new set of rules and making things convenient and easy in a different way. So technology has made sharing easy. And so it's because of many kinds of technology that we could ever do Zipcar, that you could ever go reserve a car in seconds, that we could make, Zipcar made personal cars as easy and cheap as owning your own car. That's what we were able to do because of technology. I can now travel in cities around the world and take mass transit because I can figure out where to get on the bus and where to transfer and where to get off. Before, I could never, ever touch those things. And of course, we have the rise of e-hailing and, and the potential for ride sharing. And I want to say real ride sharing, as in strangers meeting up in a car who are going directionally in the same way. This is only possible because of technology. We could never, ever accomplish these things without technology. On the other hand, there's this question that says, that was asked two different ways. One is by a, a researcher from UC Davis, um, Regina Churlow. If e-hailing and ride sharing did not exist, how would you go? And this is pulled from the um, New York City 2017 Mobility Report, where they asked the same question. And I'm just going to do the green, the blue with the blue. Um, so 24% of the people said they would have walked or cycled if the e-hailing hadn't existed. I think, oh my gosh, that is how we love to do things that are easy and cheap. They would have walked or bicycle, and now because it's easy to take a cab, they're taking a cab. It's like phenomenal. 
And yes, 15% or 50%, depending whether you're talking about New York City or the whole of the US, would have taken transit. So people do the easy, cheap thing every time. And so if I think about the future of self-driving cars, which might be coming next, um, wait, one more piece of this. Technology has also enabled on-demand consumption and made delivery easy and convenient. And I just have to ask, who in this audience, raise your hand if you have had a delivery, if you ordered something online in the last week delivered to your house? I want to say I'm appalled you live in New York City. <laughs> so the consequences on city retail if we buy everything online, and the consequences of the street and curb use are incredible. In 2000, only 1% of retail was online in the US. It's 10% in 2017, and it's moving to 60% by 2030, is a prediction. So just imagine the stress and how it's going to transform what, if, what re the retail situation looks like on streets and what that curbside pick up and drop off is gonna look like. So into this mix of us choosing the easy and cheap things, Enter self-driving cars, where I can it is so much cheaper. There's researchers at UC Davis that are pointing out that it's a penny and a half a mile for the marginal cost of an electric autonomous vehicle. We've taken out the driver, we've taken out your body, it's not even your own time. So if you picture a city, what would you not do for 50 cents an hour? Where would you not send that vehicle for 50 cents an hour? It is your free slave for 50 cents an hour. Go do any crazy idea I have in my mind. Go do it. It's only cost you 50 cents in marginal costs. This, for me, is a terrifying future. I'm going to say nice things about them later. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not going to show this video, but I'm going to urge you guys to write down. You should go see this video on YouTube that I produced, and you can search for Robin Chase self-driving cars that lays out the heaven and hell possibility of, of how these cars can play out in the cities. And there is a heaven vision, um, but the heaven vision only happens if we do the right things today. Otherwise, the status quo will deliver us our hell. Remember that underpricing that I was talking about? That is our regulatory and tax system that we have today? That delivers too cheap, too cheap to travel, and now we're making it cheaper still. So however much we've overconsumed car travel today, it will be double and triple overconsumed when we have self-driving cars. So if we understand that people naturally choose easy and cheap, and that infrastructure is destiny, which it is, it becomes our truth, and autonomous vehicles are imminent, at least in our major cities, then what we know for sure is that over the next five years, we have to specifically and with hard work and proactively rework our regulatory tax, physical space, and data infrastructure to make active and shared transport easy, fair, and cheap. This has to be the direction we are going, without question, at full speed. So that was number one. So I feel that we have been spending the last 20 years with this old paradigm that is very broken. And so we need to build on this new solid ground. And this new building on solid ground will think a lot about street capacity, how many people per square meter we're moving, and emissions. And I want to just start with a story. So in 2000, when I co-founded and ran Zipcar, the policy questions, you guys have forgotten this because it happened so long ago, the policy questions we had to work through. Was Zipcar car rental or not? Was it, should they get commercial plates or personal plates? Was it allowed to park in loading zones if it got commercial plates? Could it park in loading zones? Wouldn't we all think that was a boon, that you could park your car in a loading zone? Was it an illegal business when it parked, was parked in a residential neighborhood? Because it's a business, even though the individuals using it are those of us who live in the neighborhood. All of those issues had to be worked out because we had legislation and regulatory ideas that were in these silos that Zipcar broke the silos. This wasn't the only one of these stories. In 2007, and I want to say here in New York with Motivate, when Philippe was putting these bicycles on the streets, it was, oh, is this a public transportation? If it's public transportation, it's run by the private sector. Are we putting, letting the private sector make money on our personal public streets? Oh, no. You know, and does it make my own bicycle? Does my own bicycle make public transportation? So we had all these questions because, again, we had put things into silos that no longer made sense. Of course, in 2011, it was Sidecar that started ride-hailing, and Uber and Lyft who made it successful. 
and the whole huge disruption. Are they taxis? Of course they are taxis. But no, they're not taxis. Are the drivers employees? Are they not employees? Do they have to have special inspections, even though I've got my car inspected? What's the type of insurance? You know, do we toggle between these two things? Our current regulatory framework completely does not allow for this kind of thing. Enter 2020. Lots and lots of car companies are saying they will start selling self-driving cars by 2020. So when I rent out, when I live in some distant suburb, I don't live here, tell me a distant suburb in New York City, I own my AV there, I send it into town to make some money, is that car rental? Is that a taxi? Oh, if, it's, if there's four people in it, do we get to call it public transit? But if I go by myself, is it no longer public transit? Is it a taxi? Like, all of these decisions don't make any sense. That we keep regulating in this space that doesn't make any sense. So, here's my proposal. I, I just want to point out that, that regardless of what's coming, it's metal boxes on scarce streets. And we've spent 100 years learning the disaster of metal boxes on scarce streets streets, like we have to solve for that problem. So let's focus on some root issues. Um, to this point of focusing on root issues, about a year ago exactly today, I um, had worked with these nine NGOs that I want to say are the leading NGOs in cities and transport, and we spent seven months of torture, I want to say, since I had to be on every one of these calls, coming up with these shared mobility principles for livable cities. I wanted to point out that there was a common vision and a common set of principles that cut across all of the advisors who worked with cities. And so we came up with these. I'll talk about some of them later. And then in February, I invited a whole bunch of private sector passenger companies to join in. And you can see that these companies that we've been talking about, so Lyft and Uber and Didi, um, there's Keolis who does big mass transit. Today we have over 130 um, companies and NGOs that have signed on to say, we endorse these principles. And what I love about this work is that it is created, it is said, whether you're a private sector, whether you're the government, whether you're an NGO, there are things we all agree on. We all know we want to go towards this future of active and shared mode dominant cities. And the way you get to that future is through these 10 principles. And, it was, and so we now have this common ground on which the public and private sector can work together. And so um, I'm going to only talk today about these three. And this work has been incredibly satisfying and useful in getting the public and private sector to work together. So number six, I'm just going to put this quickly. We obviously need to transition to zero emission transportation. And this is my most boring slide. Um, I would say out of the gate, at the minimum, let's target intensively used vehicles. Those vehicles that are doing 50 to 100,000 miles a year, they're all those delivery trucks, all the fleet vehicles, all the taxis. Those should be zero emission vehicles. And so starting in 2020, when they go buy a new one and add it to their fleet, make that zero emission vehicle. And by 2025, the entire fleet should be switched over. In um, San Francisco, a week and a half ago, C40 has just come up with something called the Declaration of Health and Green, Green and Healthy Streets, in which cities, I think there are 15 of them, have all said that they will be having their bus fleet that will be zero emission by 2025. So we really need to get there. And then number two to get to the zero emissions spot is to support the shifting of modes, transportation options, from me driving in my personal car that is a fossil fuel car to modes that are more people in those square meters or by foot or by mass transit or by bike, just shifting those modes to less um, fuel, fossil fuel greedy versions. So I want to pass on from this to move the other things that are more challenging. So back to my metal boxes on scarce streets. We actually have two tools. We can do space, cities have, they can reallocate space, or they can impose user fees. And I'm just going to point out that they are shared mobility principle number three and shared mobility principle number seven. And so this is what we have to do with. Cities have these two options, two tools. Let's talk about space allocation. This is a picture from Market Street in San Francisco that is really impressive. They took what used to be six lanes of car traffic and reallocated it. And so this middle red lane is 
bus and mass transit only, and they push 60 people per lane block through. Here they have the bike lane, and they get 40 people per lane block through. And here is the personal cars or miscellaneous, the rest, and they get 12 people per lane block. But remember, this used to be all personal cars. And by shifting and reallocating the space, they're getting many, many more people through during rush hour. And so this space reallocation is a tool that cities have. And I was thinking, and I don't know what the rules would be, but what would be the fair public streets reallocation rules? What would, so what would that look like? What are the yeah, fair allocation streets across all rule uses look like? So we need to have more protected infrastructure for pedestrians in congested streets, which was done famously and well here in, in New York with Times Square. Um, active curb drop-off. Think of how many years we have been doing pick-up and drop-off and all the double parking that's happening. And now that's being amplified by Uber and Lyft and more taxis and by the online delivery. So this is a problem that's existed for a long time, hugely amplified. Let's rethink how we do pick-up and drop-off at streets. The small footprint lanes. The ones that are less than a meter wide, we have a huge explosion of electric scooters and the dockless electric bikes, and they have the fastest uptake of any transportation mode ever, these electric scooters, but they don't have any place to go and they don't have any place to park. We need to address those issues. So let's move on to user fees today. Around the world, cities are expressing ambivalence. They say, Robin, you can ride your bike, which has a very small footprint and zero emissions, or take your 30-year-old minivan that you never maintain. We don't care. That's the sig signal that cities are sending me around the world. Of course they care. But they're not, making, they're not telling me that in any way. And it's similarly, they're saying, hey, all of you guys alone in your cars, go alone in your cars and use people who are fantastic in taking public transit, and there's 30 of you in that, we're treating you all the same. It's the same to us. It is not the same to us. It is clearly not the same to us. We need to have some signals. And so Adam Smith said that taxes and space allocation should be efficient, certain, convenient, and fair. And it is not efficient. It is not certain. It is not convenient and it is not fair. Maybe it's convenient because we did this in 1911 or whenever we put the gas tax in. But the rest, it's, it is none of those things. So we really have to rethink. If we think about this future going forward, I want to make this an urgent rethinking because government revenues from transportation today, and I want to say today the old reality, what we think the reality is, we're getting taxes from vehicle fees like excise taxes, gas taxes, parking fees, and traffic and moving violations. This is collected at you know, city, state, and federal levels. That's what we're doing. But what's really happening today, as we're in this transitional mode, is we have more shared cars. So for every zip car, you take 13 cars off the road, which means 13 cars, 12 cars less annual vehicle taxes. We all know that as we move to electric vehicles, our gas tax is going down, down, down for many reasons, inflation reasons, and because we're getting more fuel efficient. Parking fees, all of those taxis and TNCs, they don't park. So they're not getting, the, they're not absorbing, we're not getting those parking fees. And what are we getting? Way more chaos, that is true. And so here, what's gonna happen tomorrow if we actually achieve the goal that we want, which is to have more walking, bikeable, shared mode cities, it is going to decimate taxes because we're gonna have mostly shared cars. So all those cars will be one car being used by 40 people. So will have dramatic drops there. We won't have any fossil fuel cars. So all those gas taxes that are paying for our infrastructure inadequately though it is, will be disappearing. No on-street parking because we'll all be doing shared vehicles. And the autonomous, hopefully, will be having no traffic or moving violations. So our tax regimen is completely uh, destroyed by going where we want to go. So let's think ahead. Where do we, how are we going to do this in the future? And of course, I have a suggestion. <laughs> So cars have three ways that they can, three, three states of cars. One, they can move. Two, you can store them. Or three, they have curb access. And I want to propose that the scarcity is how many square meters on a street are you taking up? How many square meters does it take when you're moving on the street? I want to charge you per square meter for your movement. When you store, I want to charge you per square meter for parking. When you are at the curb, I want to charge you per square meter per minute. This is the rational piece. And so if we imagine this, we would have road user fees, that is instead of gas taxes, and those would cover buildings and maintenance, the building and maintenance of our infrastructure. 
we would have congestion pricing, which would prioritize high value use and peak times. And it would importantly fund the alternatives. Congestion pricing is made for funding efficient, better modes, as in mass transit, building better bike lanes, supporting people from an equity issue who might actually have to, have to, have to drive. Those people can, all of that is what congestion pricing is right for. And then I've been worried, quite worried about occupancy, because I really, this issue of privacy, I don't actually want you guys to have to tell me how many people in your car, how many people went from, you know, Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn to downtown Manhattan at 235. Like, I don't want to know those issues. So when I set my congestion pricing fee, I'm going to set my congestion pricing fee, imagine you're doing exactly what you're doing today, which is 1.5 people on average per car. That's the price everyone's going to pay. And if you have an autonomous vehicle and you're zero in that car, you're paying for one and a half. Everyone would be paying one and a half based on, based on one and a half occupancy. And then we would have occupancy incentives. So if you put more than one and a half people and you want to tell me in an audible way and say, oh, I have five, I have two, I have seven. So if you're Uber or Lyft or a taxi driver with more than two people or a bus, or via, or chariot, you're going to say, I'm going to opt in, and I'm going to tell you how many people are in this car. And if you have enough people per square meter, your congestion charge is going to go down to zero. Because I'm really thrilled with the efficiency that you're moving people through. So we're charging everyone for user fees. We're charging everyone for congestion pricing. And if you use that street more efficiently and get more people per square meter, price goes down. So I don't want to talk through this too much. But what does that mean? It means that if you're a big car, you pay more. If you're a small car, you pay less. If you are a shared and small use vehicles, you won't be storing because all those shared vehicles don't get parked very much. Curb access, we would now instead of dropping one person off at a curb, I would have incentive to drop three people off at this parking spot, at this bus stop. Congestion pricing. We need to, starting out of the gate, whether you think your, place is, your street is congested or not, have a congestion pricing toggle. And at a certain point, when the speed's slow, we'll say, hey, this street is congested because we built 10 high rises near it. It's going to toggle, and you're not going to have congestion pricing. We have to get this stuff in now, because we know we can never do it again later. So people know, once it becomes congested, we start charging for it. And I talked about the occupancy reasons. So if we had this type of thing, I want to say, because you are human, and I'm really generous, you're getting one square meter for free. You can move your one square meter for free, for free, because you're human and you have, live on this earth. That means if I'm walking, I don't pay a congestion price. If I'm taking my bicycle, or an electric scooter, or some small thing, I'm also not paying, because I'm using space really efficiently. But if you are any of the other things, we're going to start charging you per square meter. And I also want to say, I would, this is a, so just putting this per square meter, et cetera, it means this is for free, and this is for free, and this is still for free. Public transit, oh my god, the most efficient use of space. It is like the most fantastic. You will never pay congestion pricing. I would say that I would charge you for congestion pricing, and then you would say to me, so it would be fair user fees across all modes, and when the people, the citizens say, oh my gosh, public transit gets so many benefits, I'd say, no, they're paying the same rate you are, but they put so many people in there, they got those occupancy incentives they pay zero. And so we get down to, of course, the worst thing, your own car, and, and flying, that takes up a little space. Um, and so if we went through these lists, car sharing, we would have done the right thing. Ride hailing, we would have no problems. Same thing with e-scooters. We would know how to deal with all of these new innovations because it would just fit into what is the space on the street? How many people are occupying it? Are you going during congestion or not? And so we would favor small, efficient vehicles. It would all be good. All of these things would just fall out. We don't have to make up and decide what category do things fit into. They're all the same. So just a few examples. In San Francisco, right this very second, it's a $110 fine for an illegally parked car. There we have an illegally parked truck. I want to say, as a cyclist, this is such a familiar scene to me. Yet, they just passed as $500 for illegally parking a scooter. That is not fair user fees across all modes. We have this opportunity that people are willing to get into these crazy scooters and go places instead of that car, and we are smacking them down with crummy regulation. And I, since I'm here in New York, I can't leave you out. Um, in New York City, proposed and maybe, maybe enacted is personal cars go for free, and 
oh, if you're taking a car that never requires parking, it's going to be 250 to 275 per trip for these vehicles for hire. And little did I know, I don't know New York City, but the uh, distinction between personal cars and vehicle for hire cars is completely transparent. <laughs> It looks the same to me, and, is the, and the number of people in those vehicles looks the same. So we really need to start thinking about how can we recognize congestion is car caused by square meters on the road, and when you put more people in there, we'll reduce that congestion price. So I think it's possible to start today. We could take the fees that we have today, so the excise taxes we have today, the tolls we have today, the parking violations we have today, and start saying we're converting that into square meters. So we already have that data. It's already, they already know what kind of car I drive. I don't actually own a car. But it would be really easy to say, instead of $67 excise tax, Robin, you have a small, delightful car. You're going to pay 62 When someone's got a bigger car, they're going to pay 82 But we can start in people's minds thinking about square meters and recognizing that is the operative thing. So where do we want to go? Active and shared transport, making that easy, fair, and cheap. That is the future that we have to get to. I didn't get to say my favorite metaphor. The whole transportation space is an explosion right now. And as I feel like it's tectonic plagues that are completely in motion. Every single thing is in flux. Every single stakeholder is thinking, what is going to happen to my industry, my sector, my taxes, my labor? What we know is we need, because of climate change, we need those, those tectonic plates will cool, and we need them to cool on the side of active and shared transport. It must cool there. We have no time to get it wrong. So we have to rethink how we are building this stuff out. So we start today. We, have, we build on this solid ground. And this, I'm sorry, this photo is um, unbeautiful, but that's because this is a photo from Seoul, Korea. This is called the Chungcheng Highway. And in the 60s and 70s, they built these 12 or 16 lanes of traffic over a river. And there was a mayor who thought, I want to become president of Korea one day. And I'm going to do a really, really hard thing that's going to be a big fight. And everyone's going to hate it, hate me for it. And he built this. And he uncovered, he ripped down those highways. And he uncovered that stream. And he made this spectacular thing. And he went on to become president of um, Korea. And I visited it, and it is a spectacular place. And so leaving you with infrastructure's destiny. If we build this, that's what we get. And if we build this, we get a different kind of future. And which is the kind of future that we want? It's quite clear to me, but we have to get this transition right. We have to do these things in a rational, convenient, fair way. And then I'm concluding with my final slide, which is this new Urban Mobility Alliance. The, the mission statement of it is to channel the technology-driven disruption in the transport sector to deliver cities that are livable, sustainable, and just. So all of the chaos that is being caused right now in transport, making so many people unhappy, and so many rules to have to be redone, what an amazing opportunity. We have this moment to rethink and get it right. And so I'm leaving you with that. Thank you. Robin, that was fantastic, and uh, much food for thought. And as we settle in here for a little conversation, I just want to say yeah. that we've also got the head of who's actually going to be driving this here. So my collaborator in NUMO is Ani Gupta because it's housed in the World Resources Institute, and he heads the Ross Sustainable Cities. And say, how many sentences? A few sentences on this new thing. Okay, yeah, just say a couple of remarks. We're real lucky he's up from Washington to actually talk about this. Thanks. Uh, I have the privilege of working with Robin. I, lo I love the restless Robin <laughs> thing. <laughs> <laughs> Which basically means I'm playing catch up mm -hmm. most of the time. Um, but I just want to say two things that Robin talked about. I hope Robin has convinced you that uh, mobility will, is changing now as we speak. Robin had many examples is fundamental will shift in cities. It will change cities. The question is, will it change for the better or not? That's the question Robin is posing you, the decisions we need to make. And I want to point out that these change is taking place now. I'm going to use three quick examples. Robin talked a lot about Uber. Those of you who read newspaper, I hope some of you still do. Um, 
You know, London banned Uber recently. In London, which is one of the world's most capable cities, has actually the top transport comp uh, company running the city, banned Uber because they couldn't figure out the question Robin was asking. Who should we charge? Who should pay for? What should we do? So they banned the Uber uh, Ubers rather than banning the private cars. They could have done that right. They're also causing congestion. So that's one example. The second example, Robin talked about these um, buses, the zero carbon buses, which they, they announced. So Shenzhen in China has 10,000 buses, electric buses. Actually, a little more than 10,000 right now. 16,000. Do you know how many electric buses there are in New York City? Ten. <laughs> I actually don't know. I think it's less than 10. So I worked with a company, Siemens, one of the biggest engineering companies in the world, which is trying to electrify New York buses. They were trying to electrify three buses, actually. And they gave up after a year of trying. Because it's not easy. This transition is not easy. Robin talked about electric scooters. So far, two people have died in electric scooters. Only two so far, but most probably more. My city where I live, which is Arlington, Virginia, is a little progressive city next to Washington. Last two years back, an independent was elected the first time, rather than a Democrat, and the whole city was, oh my god, what are we going to do? We were going to it. So they are now putting together policies to do what to do with electric scooters, which I agree with Robin is actually, I don't know if you've ridden one, that I haven't seen many in New York, it's actually very easy thing to get onto and use, but the people are figuring out $500. This transition that is taking place, every city, I give you examples of very capable cities. I work with cities that are not half as capable. We work in about 100 cities across the world. None of them are as capable as New York City and London. These cities are struggling to figure out what to do with this change. On the other side, car companies that Robin didn't talk much about, car companies and metal boxes is a trillion dollar business in the United States. One trillion dollar. They, each one of them, are trying to figure out what to do. Because they're also figuring out how this change is going to affect them and their trillion dollar business. So we are trying to figure out, okay, if both, all these people are trying to figure out what to do, what shall we do to get this answer right? And so we tried to, the, maybe the most difficult thing is to bring them together. The cities, the businesses, the future business and mobility most probably won't be the trillion dollar business owner. Most probably some other businesses that are actually in your phone right now, maybe Google, maybe someone else, is how to get these different parties who are trying to figure out the future rather than telling them what to do, is to bring them together and think through what the outcome we want. And I think one of the compelling things we all have to agree, what's the future we want? So we can actually figure out a path together. And our, our mission in NUMO is to bring those people, I don't think we'll get everyone, under a big tent and try to co-create what policies, what systems, what technologies actually going to be good for people and hopefully for the planet. So that's the same. And I hope, Robin, we can, at least this room, we should invite all of them to join us to try to figure this out. Wow. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Ani. Awesome. Well, in, in this room, partly because of Ani and partly uh, Robin's Rolodex, of, or actually it's maybe the old school address <laughs> book here, but... Um, Wasn't my Rolodex. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of interesting characters in here, including a bunch with the scooter world. Actually, I was talking to a bunch of folks, actually, who have got that going here in, in uh, New York. So I'm just going to prop with a couple questions here, and then we're going to really go into conversation with you, because yeah, there's really great talent here. But one thing I did want to say is you, you did a little flick or two at New York. But how would you situate New York performance so far, but also its potential for leadership in terms of this larger American and global phenomenon that you say is really happening all over the place. Well, how, how would you kind of Well, so rate? to give New York its due that it's due is in the US, I think it has the smallest percentage of households with car ownership in the US, period. I think Manhattan is 60% of people don't own a car. That compares with Paris, and that is by far larger than any place else in the US. So that's a fantastic thing. And it's moving huge numbers of people they done the Vision Zero stuff that's really reduced fatalities, and that's really infrastructure transformations. The bike lanes that have been built up and out. So all of those are positive progress. But like every place, <laughs> there are things that, um, there's an endless room for improvement, and 
New York City of late, I feel like, is, is just like Chicago and just like New York, just like DC and just like San Francisco and just like Boston, putting in tax rules that are completely counter to the idea of the direction of encouraging more shared transport and more active transport that the, and one I just heard today that um, I have to go write a comment on before Friday is that for the minimum wage for um, vehicle for hire drivers, which the city has said that like be $18 an hour and I, it's completely fine, they want to add a dollar surcharge if they pick up any other passenger. So if you share a trip, it's a dollar surcharge, which means yet again, and it's going straight to the consumer. So the consumer says, hmm, should I take a taxi by myself? Should I drive myself? Or am I going to do a shared taxi? And it's a dollar more if I choose to do the right thing. So it is a just completely wrong direction. And, and I want to say, because all these cities are struggling to b get revenues up for their public transport system, and I completely appreciate that. But we need to do that on the back of it should be fair user fees across all modes. I just will keep repeating that we need to have a level playing field. If we want to have, if we want to have multiple modes and innovations and new successes, we need to have a level playing field. And today, the playing field is just completely far from level. That is easier and cheaper to take my own car almost every time. So if you had gave advice, because we actually have people from the public sector here in New York, um, if you had to give advice to New York, um, excuse me? I just did. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. But I would say, if you, in the next couple of years, what, what would, how, how to get this ball rolling? I was just thinking, like, is there something more concrete? Yeah, I mean, I know you gave a bunch thing of ideas. That I was just, that it's a dream, a concrete dream that I have. So, two concrete dreams. One is, I would like to see what is, what is the public engagement we can have over allocation of street space so that people conceive it in a fairness standpoint. Why is it that I am stuck in my bus like this during rush hour and all those rich people who are taking taxis, Ubers, their personal cars, whatever, are taking up all the space and I'm crushed in my little spot. I'd love to see a discussion of street allocation and space. That would be one thing I'd like to see. And the second piece I would love to see is a and also parking, and I realize we think of city streets as so many, so much parking that doesn't on all the avenues there's no parking. And remember, I'm not from New York, so if I say wrong things, but the streets have parking. And um, a short anecdote: my daughter delivered a baby at a Sinai Presbyterian, whatever, and I was going to pick her up, and I was stuck for 10 minutes behind a delivery truck a garbage truck that was emptying an entire apartment's worth of stuff into that trash. Meantime, there are two lanes of parked cars there. I was a block from the hospital, and I could not get to that hospital. So I'm just saying, what is the fair user fee? What is the fair street allocation space here that some people get to park for free a mile from the hospital? The other thing I'd like to do is I would love to do some congestion charging pilots in New York City um, using cell phones, that I think we have this opportunity that when New York City thought was talking about congestion charging and following London 10 years ago, it was already using 15-year-old technology. And we had to build this big cordon around the city. And where were you putting the cordon? And did you want to expand the cordon or subtract? And it was this $200 million investment that you had to get right and work with all the boroughs. Where is it going to go on the street light? Where is it going to point? This huge complexity. And today, I would say, I'm going to make up a number. 98% of the people who are driving a car have a smartphone in their pocket right now. And that smartphone is how we pay for Uber and how we pay for Lyft and how we decide, am I using Google Maps to tell me the, told, the path of tolls or the path without tolls? We can use that device to do congestion charging right here and right now. Infrastructure is all laid out. Let's give it a shot. Awesome. Final word before we go into the conversation. I always picture you, and every conversation I've had conversations with her over the years in many different contexts. Um, you're you're an optimist. Mm -hmm. So five years from now, what do you give us your positive sense of where, 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 where do you where do you think we're gonna? Okay. <clears throat> I mean, we're, autonomous vehicles are here. 
the millennials have moved back to the cities. You know, all, well, hopefully okay. we're through the craziness of politics yesterday. Right now. Yesterday I was in a bodega at 9 p.m. and there was a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old siblings who were in that bodega shopping. And I thought, wow, that's like fantastic that those two guys are unsupervised in this thing. Mm -hmm. And what I would really like is for that seven-year-old and that nine-year-old to be able to take their bikes to school safely, to be able to go and run errands safely for my 80-year-old mother to be able to walk or bike or get into a shared transit and get to doctors quickly and easily at a price that she could afford. And I feel like we could completely transform. There's this beautiful picture I was seeing of Brooklyn in 1890, and it had the white sidewalks and the trees and the brownstones and this lovely lane. And what do we have today? We have the brownstones, the trees, the white sidewalks, and all of these cars and all of this traffic. And there's just this, it's not a livable, delightful place. It's loud, scary, noisy, expensive, and annoying. I love New York. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a city person, I actually do. But just to imagine that we could be transforming the streetscape. It could be a calmer, safer, more equitable, and I would be able to use shared transport as other people would pick up and drop offs that don't annoy people, that are in the right spots. We don't have all that double parking, that we figured out the street allocation, and that the subway is just like Beijing subway. Crystal clean, beautiful, delightful. I don't think you can do that in five years, but I think you could clean the subway in five years, <laughs> and you can build some new lines, and we could move more people through. I do think that could happen. All right, let's turn it over here. And just remember, we're doing the live stream here, and so when we point out you folks, grab the mic, introduce yourself, stand up, introduce yourself, and then uh, make your comment or, 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 uh, or question. Here, let's start here, and then we'll go back to that. Now comes the hard part. Yes. Um, Hello. Uh, my name is Makran Booth, and um, uh, I come from India. And uh, I go back and forth between uh, uh, New York and Bombay and Beijing and uh, all these places. Um, I would like to put out some terms in the context of now New York and some of the things which I thought would uh, complement to what Robin was saying. So you started with uh, destiny. I would add to that density. I will add to that drainage because congestion, you know, um, when we say destiny and we say destiny, the so mobility is a problem of migration. You know, uh, as, as after that, drainage, because the more surface area we have, you know, uh, whether those are bicycle lanes or whether those are super highways, we have flooding, urban flooding, whether that's North Carolina or whether that's Kerala, you know, across the world, because, and this is an urban phenomena, it's a uh, outcome of the transportation and mobility. Then I will add to it dignity. And where we come to the fair, and uh, actually like, you know, when these nine different, uh, you know, NRDC or uh, ICICI, you know, like all these are leading mobility experts, uh, you know, and then it's about the policy making. So when we are taking, talking about fair, you know, so uh, there are two kind of policy props we have. One okay. is could, could, okay, but we got to get. Yeah, can yeah. you get to the question or, or exactly? Finish up uh, you know, a lot what, of what I'm trying to do is to sort of some of these things which will complement to this conversation, and uh, you know, so when the fair pricing is there, and when we are talking about density and dignity, uh, there is policing. You know, the enforcement of the fares and fees you know, is, is policing. And then if you have to pay a $190 ticket with a bicycle where there is no bicycle lane going on a sidewalk. I would say you know? it's not fair user fees. Exactly, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, 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 uh, so that's okay. the thing. And then there's one more thing which is uh, 
coming. Uh, okay, I, what. I would, what I will say is intermodal. I would like to actually uh, have a response, <laughs> you know, about the intermodal exchange, you know, which is a hop and a hop off, and something which we have started taking, which is the vision zero. Okay. And uh, okay, so one last question yeah, no, is, we, we got the question. You know, we got the, the question. One last question the, the is about, you know, like Zipcar or like Uber, what if the New York City would have this <coughs> Uber or Lyft app? What is stopping them? Okay. Ta -da. All right. Do you have any okay, comment? Okay, I just have, I have a quick short. comment. One of the shared mobility principles, I think number eight, I've got these memorized now, um, is public benefits via open data. And the reason we need to have more open data and it brings public benefits is because we need to have interconnectivity between modes and we need to have competition within modes. And it's open data and standard open data that will deliver those things. And so I think that would be my answer to that. It's a key piece and I could give a whole other talk on open data and the implications of that. But That's a good one. All right. We got one person back here. Do you have a question too? Uh, uh, Go ahead. Stand up and introduce yourself. And again, sure. just kind of keep the, because we got a lot of folks who want to talk, so yeah. just keep a nice tight. Um, <laughs> maybe I sit down because I think it's a little bit too high, but Marie Barry, um, Chinatown Bureau. Uh, thanks so much for the talk. I think it was really interesting. I'm excited to hear that point of view and really also how there's incentives for, that are consumer friendly. Um, the two questions I have, um, having worked on um, a large uh, OEM, so in the private sector, also having worked with the city of New York on initiatives towards um, electrifying the city, as well as now having my own startup, so I'm like um, in the tech ecosystem a small player. The questions um, I have looking at smart city mobility um, are two. It's the first is the funding and really having like the catalyst. Who is starting this? Because you're saying in terms of tax and regulation, you're talking about the government, about um, federal city um, regulations, but it's still who is starting this whole machine? Um, or how can we work together to get there? Um, because I've seen a lot of great initiatives, but often nothing really comes out of it. You know, there's great pilots. I've seen so many great pilots, but then in the end it's like, how can we really make this happen? And the second question would be um, in terms of regulation. So similar to planes and airports, you know, there's like systems in place to organize all this. Um, who is then the instance, who is the institution who will then take control, like monitor this, and who has in the end the right to say what's fair and what isn't? So those are the two questions, funding and uh, monitoring or regulation. And while she's answering that, can I see hands of people that wanted to speak? I'm just trying to get angles here. Oof, okay, right. I'll try to go as fast as I can. Those are really good questions. From a funding perspective, um, the generosity of Stephen Ross over the next two years is definitely just a drop in the bucket. So I would say my theory of change, which is so far in a few weeks, in the few weeks, <laughs> in the few months that we've existed, proving true, is that um, our goal is to get these multiple stakeholders aligned around where we are going and with their own resources and their own self-interests and their own staff they're going to help make those things happen. And I think Wednesday you will be seeing some uh, announcements that I'm not going to pre-announce around that. And I was just talking with um, MIT today about open source coursework and developing a new urban mobility curriculum. And when I was talking, they said, yeah, we have money to develop curriculum. We would like to do that. So it's their money. They're already doing it. They want to. So I think, and similarly with cities, they have to address their own revenue issues, and so let's bring, elevate, these are issues, these are problems, these are directions, and they need to do that themselves. The second part was who's gonna be in charge? Um, I think we'll have to wait to see how that plays out. I think the open data will be very important. I've talked to the city of Vancouver, and one of the things they were thinking of is that their public transport authority would become a mobility manager, and would lay out here are the, the passenger bill of rights, here are issues around 
equity or size, and we will manage it. We won't be up doing any of the services. So I think we'll see many, many iterations, and who in heck knows? I don't know. Emergent. Um, go ahead here, and then we got over here. Go ahead. And then here. And then we'll go She's here. Been waiting a long yep. time. Yes. Sure, we'll get uh, to you. Hi, Robin. This is Subnat. Uh, I'm uh, working on uh, a startup. Uh, we are developing portable motors for bikes. Could, could you get a little closer to that? Uh, so I wanted to kind of get your take on the e-scooters. Uh, there, there was a favorable kind of a hint in your talk towards the e-scooters in terms of the throughput. But uh, don't you think that it's kind of replacing walking in a way, and it's kind of going back to the same point of making you lazier in terms of uh, the distance? Because I feel the solution to, or a part of the solution to the mobility crisis is to kind of get more people off cars onto other sustainable modes. And I think bikes are fantastic. And they have a longer range in terms of mobility. So I was curious about your take on the e-scooters. Um, I am happily an American. And um, for people to choose their own path, and I, something that I've really understood over now 20 years of working in <coughs> mobility, is I think I used to think, yeah, everyone should be riding a bike and walking. Yes. That we that we that we're t when talk about diversity, but what we really mean is we hate cars and we only like the other stuff. But we'll <laughs> say nice things about diversity. Now, at the age of sixty, my birthday was two days ago. Um, at the age of sixty, I can tell you that I believe profoundly that we need to have a huge diversity of modes in the thing. That you are born and then you grow and you grow older and you might have a broken leg, you might be pregnant, you might have a child, you might have no money, you might have lots of money, you might be carrying a heavy package, it might be raining. I have no idea. We need to be able to offer people a huge suite of options because we have a huge suite of life expectations and realities. And so I'm completely now opposed to anything that is single mode. That's, I mean, our whole world has been built out around cars being the answer to everything and everyone. And all those people who are older than the age of 84, made that up, who shouldn't be driving, who should th think about not driving, are still driving because they are locked in. Or people who are less than 16. So we need to have a whole suite of things. Electric, vehicle, electric scooters, the early results are that it is pulling people out of their personal cars, which is, oh my gosh, if that's going to happen, we should definitely be going for that. And yeah, there'll be people who are not walking and not taking subway, just like they're doing now in their personal cars. They're not walking and not taking subways. Um, I know there's lots of questions. One thing I didn't say in my talk, when we have the, um, what would you do if e-hailing did not exist, what other modes? We have not asked that question of people who are going in their personal cars. If you didn't go in your personal car in New York City, where, how would you have gone? And so we keep comparing the TNCs and the options that people would take. And I would say, take all the people and the people who go in their own cars and say, if your own car didn't exist, how would you go? So we're not <coughs> even measuring people and on equal, as, as scientists and researchers, we're doing a terrible job. Now we're gonna to go to another one, but I know talking just, how many people in here have something to do with e-scooters or bikes or some kind of mobility situation? Because I've noticed a bunch yes. of different entrepreneurs here. It's like literally about half a dozen, seven, seven eight books. It's interesting, so love to have, pull you in. By the way, we're gonna just jump, he, he has the, right now and then we'll go to your thing. Go ahead. Could you stand up and identify yourself? Uh, hi, my name is Michael Carter. Um, so I'm from the D.C. Uh, Arlington area, uh, which is uh, it's a big urban sprawl, uh, and the, the metro there is notoriously pretty bad. Yeah, would you agree? Um, and so, because it's such a spread out area, the buses also aren't very effective, and it's also very expensive to live in like the D.C. Arlington area. Uh, so people have to drive a long way to get to their jobs. So, um, do you think that charging per uh, distance traveled could be effectively penalizing people? who, just because they can't afford to live closer to uh, their place of business? Um, two quick answers on that. One is, I don't know where you live, and I don't know the map of Washington, DC, but there's something called the Center for Neighborhood Technology that's done some spectacular maps that are heat maps of the cost of housing plus the cost of transportation. And when you put housing and transportation together, what we thought was a cheaper place to live turns out to be a more expensive place to live. So where I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, so expensive, it's cheaper than living in Bill Rico when you put those two things together. Hmm. So that's A, housing plus transportation is a set match set. And 
Um, in Houston, it's the highest, it's the only place in the country when I last looked that was paying more for transportation than for housing. So that's number one. The second piece is I used to think that it was really, really unfair that there are some people who could only drive to work and they had no other way. Now we've had the rise of apps where you can actually match people up. I now no longer, I think, you could be doing, you could be sharing that trip. You really could be finding someone else to cut that trip price in half and to be paying half the toll and half the whatever because it now exists and people are, can I say, lazy and choose the easy and convenient method. You said that, that's a good. good. Um, when, when New York City had some, a subway breakdown over, like within hours people were ride sharing, immediately on the bridges. It was just, it was within hours and they're all sharing rides. So we can do it, we can, but we just choose not to. Go ahead. Could you stand up and introduce um, yourself? Please? Hi, my name is Jane Kenyon. I'm a native New Yorker. We're up here, still live here, or again. And I ride my bike everywhere and take the subway when I don't. My question, though, has to do with things like congestion pricing and other things that are controlled by the government. As I understand it, the main reason we don't have congestion pricing here is Albany. It's not New York City. And you talked about involving the private sector and involving research organizations and advocacy. How do we involve the government and convince them to do the right thing? If we're fighting Albany all the time, we're never going to get any of this better in New York City. Um, that's an excellent could, could, could question. You, could yeah. you also explain, because people, particularly viewing this, won't understand the differentiation oh. of why is Albany controlling what's going on you in New York? Okay. <laughs> well, so Albany is the state capital, and New York State controls a lot of the budget of New York City, including ripping off from the MTA our subways and buses and moving the money to Albany instead of leaving it in the MTA to fix New York City subways where it should be. So the question is really for all cities, how do you handle whatever the government is, be it federal, state, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. city, how do you make sure they're involved from the beginning? Because I didn't hear that in your talk. Um, it's interesting, to, what you're saying is a new way of thinking about that, and I want to say it's not the way I've been thinking about that question, so I'm going to remember that and come up with a better answer. The way I've been thinking about it is government says it's politically impossible. Government says, my, those people don't want to do it and they do kicking and screaming. So I think one of the things that we hope to be doing more of is making people realize they are stakeholders and making them perceive and appreciate and demand this new future. And that they should be demanding, I want to have congestion pricing and I want to have my, my money into the MTA. But right now, people don't feel themselves as stakeholders, and they, they um, as a person who's doing transportation for this long amount of time, in my worldview, transportation is the center of everything. It's the gateway to opportunity. Can you go to school? Can you get a job? Can you see your friends? Can you go to the doctor? And I think it's the center of everything. But when you go and talk to most people, they don't think about it one second. They don't, even, they don't even see transportation. So one of the things I think we have to get at is making people realize and perceive transportation is your gateway to everything and you are a huge stakeholder and you do care. So it's a, it's, for me, that's why I want to get at government. I want people to realize, whoa, I never thought about that and it's critically important to my life. So that's something I'm eager to learn are, about. Are there, are there um by the way, here's a couple of people here. But are there any, is anyone from government that would want to? Because I know yes, there's. Oh, there right you're there. from government. There we go. Okay, so so let's. Jesus, I was going to try to get someone to, just just comment on that because I know there's. Yeah, and then Ani will get to you. I'm the New York City Transportation Commissioner, so I am government. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. And I, I have to say, Robin, thank you for this fascinating presentation. I, I, you asked sort of the question that I wanted to just ask, which is, it's completely, you had up there the, the features of what Adam Smith says taxes should look like. Find me one level of government in which taxes meet that description of fair and transparent and all. I mean, you've sort of left out the whole process of democracy. I think, and that sort of, and, and you did, maybe you're not so familiar here in New York, but like we have three levels of government that are incredibly intertwined with our transportation system. 
you know, when it comes to our transit system and to things like congestion pricing, we have something of a mismatch between, I think, at the local level, what people might want to see and what our state politics can produce. But also, you know, for example, you said, I want to see a discussion about <coughs> reallocating space for bus lanes. I'll take a little umbrage of that. I've been immersed in that very difficult discussion for the five years that I've been doing this job. I've helped in my time build 100 miles of dedicated bus lanes. It's been some of the toughest fights I have ever seen. I, I it is. It is. So, you know, and, and I, you say you think people don't care about transportation. In this city, it's the number one topic. People care passionately about it. So I, I sort of don't, I, you know, particularly in a place like New York, it's front and center on people's minds all the time. So I, I don't think it's fair to say we just need to educate them. They don't know anything about it and they're not thinking about it. They know a lot about it and they're very, very sophisticated. But, you know, they are extraordinarily divided. And you make a fair point. You know, you put up a slide there that said, it was funny, that said, we're not charging cars anything, but we're charging, you know, we're charging taxis and Ubers and Lyfts. The we is the state. Mm -hmm. The state was looking for a way to fund the MTA. They wanted to charge the cars too, but they couldn't quite get over the politics. So I think what you were showing there is sort of hopefully, and I'm looking at a colleague of mine who's running a, a commission that's now going to look at that, maybe that is a bit of an unfinished process. So I, I sort of want to make a little bit of a pitch. Things aren't quite as, I think, bleak and ignorant perhaps as you're, as you're painting New York. I think there is a lot more going on in terms of discussion. I actually think the public is very engaged. but democracy has to play a role here. I mean, I hate to say this, it's painful for me to admit this, when you're doing bus lane, when you, when you do bike lanes, there's a passionate group of bike advocates that have your back, and then there's a passionate group of people who hate them for a bunch of reasons. Bus lanes, it's a lot harder, just sort of the way democracy works, a lot of bus riders, busy people, maybe they got a couple jobs, you know, they're, they're not necessarily people who have time to engage a lot with government. People who oppose bus lanes, very well organized, very influential. So I just think to leave democracy out of the discussion, you're missing, I think, the big piece of how you'll get to your goal. So you, you asked the right question for sure. All right, that's the view from government. Fantastic contribution. I apologize for not mentioning bike lanes. And I'm with you. I'm, all, I, I'm, I'm an outsider and I agree. And I, so I think how can we get people to want to have those bus lanes and want to add more bike lanes and want it. I, it, is, it is the fight. It's the fight of all fights and we are all stakeholders. So I, I agree. Could, could someone from that commission or someone explain that commission? Would, would you get at least somebody from that group? What is the commission that's going to help, that you were saying is helping solve this problem? It's, thank you, Paul. <laughs> Oh, is that, is that an no, no. I, mean, it's, really I would say okay. it's, it's obtuse and that is very specific to New York okay. state and city. But I will say every, I talk to some cities and say, oh, they say, oh, you know, New York can do all these things. And I'm laughing that it's, you know, it's the grass is always greener. When you're on the inside, then you know all these crazy things. And, and so, yeah, London has these different issues and Toronto has different issues. And every place has their, who owns the curbs, who owns the sidewalks. Who owns the MTA? Who owns the streets? So this city has a very particular relationship. So this relationship. is the Metropolitan Transportation Sustainability Advisory group, Work Group. Okay. And, it, and its purpose, it was created in legislation last year because the city, state, legislature, governor could not, in the budget process, agree on how we're going to fund a sustainable program to support mass transit. And so this was created to have a table where the city, the state, uh, the governor, the legislature, the MTA, the State Department of Transportation sit down together and try and figure out what is the funding gap to have an adequate mass transit system and what are the options for filling it uh, both in terms of more efficiencies and cost reductions, as well as additional revenues, both self-generated and funded through the taxpayer and the toll payer, and how do we put that together? So this is a process to try and get everybody who has to participate in the decision to reach on very complicated issues, as you pointed out, to reach consensus. So I think it's very much along the lines you're talking about, trying to figure out how to make, and this is only recommendations, it's purely advisory but how to figure out how to bring to all these players, and they have appointed the members of the commission, so everybody has 
representatives on the commission that will have a voice in congestion pricing and in the other actions that are needed to create a sustainable funding system for the mass transit. Fantastic news. Uh, Ani, you, you want to say something, but also for you, for, from the global perspective, I'd be curious, is this happening all over other places too? Because you have a... I would just going to support the comment you made from the city of New York, I mean, New York's politics. It's not unusual, this of a big city having difficulty with a high level of government. Everywhere we work, that is true, right? And sometimes, unlike New York City right now, there are different parties, the national government and the big, uh, big city. Uh, I know. <laughs> you said that, I didn't. Uh, but what I was just simply going to say to your example is that what we have found, and which I think you'll find in the United States too, is working with other cities that is not so politically content, showing the example of how it works, and inspiring change is one way we have found to get push things forward and not starting with the most, most difficult. And lots of things are happening in New York City. I mean, lots of things are happening in New York City. But it has been a very difficult conversation. I also want to make a pitch for the planners in the room. Having transport planning shared with the different levels of government is not a bad idea. You don't want every city to just own, own their planning and not have a metropolitan plan. So that's why this shared. It sometimes works, sometimes actually doesn't work very well. Fantastic. Um, uh, we're getting towards the end here, but other other thoughts here from people that want to um, get it through? Okay, let's do one here and we'll get one there. Hi. Um, I'm just a little concerned because some people like their own personal car and you're trying to get rid of it. I mean, <laughs> almost. And um, why don't you focus on getting it smaller, a smaller, more zero efficient car, um, zero emission car, and also m maybe more lanes? Why? Why? affect a person's mental health by like making them share rides? Um, that's a great question and I had tried to be, um, uh, I believe, I'll say again my favorite, fair user fees across all modes and cities have constraints. They have a specific amount of street capacity and they need to move a specific number of people in there and I think you or anyone can choose to drive your own personal car and I'm happy to have you drive your personal car, but you need to pay your fair share for that space. Right now, they're getting more than their fair share. When people are choosing to take the bus and they're completely locked in traffic so that the 30 people around them can go by themselves and you've decided to take the bus, that is so unfair, unbelievably unfair. Why would it not be unfair? Why is it not fair that I, who am taking a bus and paying my 270, and you who are in your own car. That is not the relevant piece. The relevant piece is I'm a city and I have to push people through these square meters. And so I would like the bus and the car to pay the exact same fare. For your square meters, you pay the exact same amount. And if one puts in more people, I will start per square meter, I will start reducing that because I, as a city, need to push people through during peak times. But I will charge you exactly equally, exactly equally. And so you should, right now, I would say another big issue that is discussed worldwide is are Uber and Lyft taking more people out of public transport? And I think people are rational. If I can go from one place to another for $7 and sit stuck in traffic, but as I'm alone and not in the subway and I want to be alone and not in the subway, that's fine. They should be able to do that, but they should pay for that congesting of everybody else's movement during congested time. So I think you should always have the option to do it, but you just need to pay your fair share. I mean, at the end of the day, we're talking about congestion and how people hate congestion and how they can't live with it and how do you pay for it. But what about the thought of nighttime deliveries? Because today it's the trucks, and getting, as the cities grow, and, uh, and that's where the growth of this country is going to be, and people wanting to live in cities, at the same time these roads are being, and the double parking and getting around, the trucks are really causing a lot of the problems, the deliveries. So if, I mean, one simple way is, and we're going to need jobs in the future, and it's going to, you know, also increase the amount of people you need because you need somebody in your store or whatever, to accept the deliveries, uh, it could go a long way in, in eliminating congestion. Precisely. I was talking to a person in London who is on Transport for London. She said most of the congestion was caused by double park deliveries. 
And so if we think about lane curb access, we should be, it, curb access is, a congested, is congested just like a lane, and we should be charging more for daytime delivery and very much more for peak hour, rush hour deliveries, and then of course less, nothing at nighttime. Man, shouldn't we mandate a certain amount of deliveries types if they are only are at night? I'll let the people who are doing freight and looking at the very specifics of it decide those things, but I think it is completely rational that we should be having congestion pricing on curbs, which would, I was talking to someone yesterday who was saying their bike lane is every single morning during rush hour congested by deliveries. And well, one, one thing since uh, Stephen raised this and uh, with your background in real estate, one thing you had didn't really talk about is how much parking, you know, you know, parking lots, parking structures, park, I mean, if we really did this, and yes, there's the parking on the streets, but what does that do to opening up the real estate for affordable housing? I mean, things that are also putting huge pressures on these cities, particularly at a time when this generation of millennials is moving, has moved back to cities, want to stay in the cities, they didn't abandon the cities like the boomers. We got some interesting demographic and real estate opportunities here alongside the, the transportation. Any thoughts on that, or for that matter, what your thoughts Well, just, I can just throw out some numbers. On average, cities are 30% car parking and road infrastructure and parking lots. That's on average. I was looking at a study. Houston was 63% dedicated to cars and parking and parking lots. So just the, the contrasting potential. So of course, it's going to depend on your density. You know, Manhattan, I think, probably has very little parking garage. And where it's a parking garage, it's just kind of a holding space for when are we going to build a big tower there. But if you go to a lighter density place, we definitely have parking that is taking up space that could be used otherwise. Um, so it's, it's part of this future that we think about cities are what they are. They're, they're, they're fixed and finite. And if we can extract parking garages where they exist or floors of parking in Chicago and turn that into whatever we want it to be. Is it affordable housing? Is it some kind of retail? Is it commercial space? Is it, I don't know, soccer fields, indoor soccer fields for children? I have no idea what's needed. But it is this opening up in the scarce urban space, this thing that we, brand new. It's like brand new opportunity. Okay, last People have done these studies and there's been other places. Okay, we're going to get there. And then right behind you, we'll, we'll take another person's head for a second, too. Go ahead. Uh, hello, I uh, am a lawyer and I'm fascinated uh, by the new emerging fields of cultural management and cultural intelligence. I just wanted to address the issue of maybe also discussing innovative ways of maybe including the civil society in this whole discussion. Because uh, having a very engaged and exciting populace of grassroots initiatives and people who are just um, excited to partake in the dialogue could also maybe shift the discussion in a more value-based uh, perspective. So I don't know, like maybe a very creative, innovative discussion of giving, I don't know, creating this new culture where people uh, sh shift their values in alignment to this new, uh, the, the, the new ideas and the new development that you've been speaking about could also potentially add to the whole discussion. Maybe some thoughts on this. Um, my thoughts are I'm looking at a staff member, a colleague that I just hired to do exactly that. So I think that we as NGOs or as advisors to cities have, are constantly giving policy push solutions, policy, policy, policy recommendations, and we need to create demand pull. Like that is what we want. This is what we want. And so we need to uh, rebalance, not rebalance, add, add to this discussion. What do people want and um, what do they want? Just as an example, a couple of years ago when there was the whole hype on the Pokemon game, Pokemon. Right. What was the name of that Pokemon? Pokemon uh, Go. Pokemon Go, yeah. There are a couple of uh, museums in Europe that wanted to um, infuse this uh, uh, interest in, the, in millennials, so they planted the very uh, rare Pokemons in the museums. So all the teenagers were coming into the museums to find the Pokemon, but this actually had a very profound impact in the shift of culture. Okay. So you have these 14 year olds and Excellent yeah. idea. So like stuff like that. I mean, <laughs> we'll, I we'll, we'll figure. <laughs> Now, I don't want to keep too many people from the okay. drinks and more food coming in here, but we got two last questions. We Jay. got one here. Well, actually, let's go Jay. here and then we'll go right here. 
I'll yeah. just make a quick one. Robin, uh, Jay Walder, the, the <clears throat> president and CEO of Motivate and former chairman of the MTA here in New York. And as you know, I, I love the vision and Motivate was an early uh, signer on to the vision that, that's there in terms of being able to do it. I, I would actually take you back to one of your very early slides because you, you put up a picture of Levittown and you said the inevitability of the, the interstate transit, uh, the interstate highway system coming into our urban areas came out of that. And, and I think we do have to bring land use into this somewhere as well. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you look and, and take it out of a U.S. context, two cities that I think provide a fantastic uh, example of this are, are Hong Kong and Singapore. Singapore, of course, having started the first ERP system, electronic road pricing system. Uh, Hong Kong, which really has invested much more in, in land use and the connection to the transit system, actually has a much higher modal share for public transit yeah. than, than Singapore does. You know, in this city, Stevens here, I mean, the, the, the shiny example of this, of course, is Hudson Yards and the development and the extension of the number seven line. But, but if we're going to believe that we're investing in public transit on a going forward basis, not just to fix what's broken, but to think about how we're extending it, we must be willing to reshape our cities with land use. And I think we're, we're still a long way away from that. And I wonder how you incorporate that into the vision that you have here right now. Um, if it, it, I feel like I've, I've used up a lot of your time. <laughs> and I was trying to make this set s smaller. But in my world vision, where, of course, transportation is the center of everything, and I think you can like substitute energy or labor as the center of anything. But if we talk about this explosion that's hap explosion of innovation that's happening and disruption happening in transportation, it is impacting, we talked about, it's impacting government revenues, it's impacting labor and, and ability to get to employment, it's impacting la land use and how we build, it's impacting the, the energy types and uses and the environment. So I, those four areas are in, in our trajectory for this new entity this globalized, because yes, these are ripple effects that transform everything. And, and what I can say is I'm not an expert in those things. And so we need to bring forward experts in these arenas. And so we'll be putting together a task force on labor, a task force on land use. I've been talking to ULI um, and getting those experts to say, what are our shared principles? What do we think is the theory of change and how we can make change fast? So that is, it's a big job. I'm hoping you guys are signing up. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll have another talk on that uh, another time here. Final call here, and then, uh, and then we'll hang sure. out. Um, I'll try to go very quickly. I wanted to actually build off of that last question and kind of bring it back to the early slides on uh, infrastructure as destiny and some of that. And we spent a lot of time thinking about things that drive on infrastructure and things that interact with infrastructure, but not actually a lot of time on the infrastructure itself. And just wondering if you could maybe leave us with some thoughts about how things that have, you know, five, 10, 20, 30 years to build and that have a lifespan of decades can react to changes that are coming faster than we can even write policy, let alone build the right infrastructure. Yes, another talk that I gave probably 10 years ago that I used to do a lot was around stuff, you can change people's moving atoms takes a really long time. So building that high speed rail between you know, New York and Washington and Boston or on the West Coast, you could start today and it's gonna take 25 years before it's starting to make a real dent in CO2 reductions. Or you can do congestion charging, overnight 25% drop. You can, do, you can change this road allocation with paint and overnight change. So the work that I'm really interested in is how to transform behavior and do things with the paint and bullards and pricing because we need changes really fast and overnight. So I'm not going to be the person who's working on the Hyperloop or the person who's going to be working on high-speed rail because we need to use the assets and resources we have right here and right now and, and move forward. That I, We don't have time to build a lot of stuff. We can think about that, 5% of people can think about that, 95% of us make the bigger change. And I feel like right now, people, it's the reverse, that people are very focused on building these big things that are gonna take a long time, and we're gonna need them, but we need more people focused on how we can make change fast. 
Amen. And with that, let's give Robin a huge. Fantastic. Plenty to talk. Talk amongst yourselves. We've got food, we've got drink. She'll be here and uh, spread the word of what's now. See you another time.